All right, so uh, this is going to be the last talk in this uh, big giant format. Um, after this, there's going to be about a two-hour break, and uh, we're going to do some switcheroo type stuff and uh, break it down into two, and then uh, and then uh, ultimately three tracks uh, tomorrow. So uh, this is the last of the big room talks, and uh, we saved uh, Chris Nickerson for last, and uh, I think he's actually going to give you an uh, option on the presentation that he's going to that he's going to give. So that's really cool. So let's give it up for Chris Nickerson. Hello. Oh, <laughs> just like at home. That's awesome. <laughs> Touch it and it comes on. Um, so be because I've kind of talked about compliance and anyone who knows me already hates me and anyone who doesn't will very quickly, um, I figured I would give you guys an option because I'm sleep deprived and I don't really give a shit what it says on a program. Um, so, the Gorillas and the Liars talk is about the history of guerrilla warfare, and compliance is about why compliance is stupid. What do you think? <laughs> okay, tell me, like, all right, who wants me to do the gorilla one? This is so arbitrary, it's awesome. Who wants me to do the compliance one? Okay. I'm all click, 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 click. Shit. What should I do? You. Oh, I, I saw a lot maker. of I saw a lot of non-voters in the audience. Let's let's try that one more time. Who wants the compliance talk? You must vote. Who wants the gorilla talk? The gorilla talk. Looks it's close, dude. Pretty clo it's you're, close. You're the moderator, dude. I just talk shit. Gorilla talk. Okay. Sweet. So I have to like. And that's do. only because it's the one that's not on the schedule, and so we never do what we're supposed to. Nice. I like it. All right. So does that work? Ha! Ah, kind of. Sort of. All right. Cool. Uh, There it is. Done. Should I do the compliance talk now? All right, how does this thing work? Click, 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 click. Dude, look at, I got buttons. Look at the, it's good that this is only gonna take like 10 minutes, so. I can just sit up here and screw around for a while. I'm going to, yeah, yeah, it's actually home's way quicker than that. But, uh, all right, grill talk. Hi. I'm, um, so, uh, yeah, thank you for allowing me to sit here and give talks. Yeah, I know, that's boring, isn't it? Uh, I gave this talk once at Tech P, um, and they all went to sleep during it. <laughs> I mean, like, the whole audience was sleeping and just sitting there and listening to me give a presentation, which was really, really boring. But whatever, I'm Chris, and this is me in various different formats. Um, the wide frame format is one of my favorites because I decided to give a talk on how to pick up chicks using neuro-linguistic programming and embedding commands and all sorts of really, really fun techniques. But I thought it'd be really funny if I gave the talk as like a 500 pound guy. So I paid a buddy who does some facial recognition beating stuff for me to go and make me a 500 pound guy and that's kind of what it looked like. Um, my credentials for doing talks like this, that's pretty much it. <laughs> uh, uh, those are probably closer to my real credentials, um, but for the most part, I'm another security dork, right? So I went out and I got a CISA because I knows how to use Google Images. Um, 
I'm pretty good with Photoshop. And it was a total trick. Like, I went and I took the test because I thought I was going to get a lock. And they screwed me over and gave me a piece of crap cert that does nothing for my life. Um, and then I got a CISSP because I'm also good at searching for things. Um, and so is William Slater, Jr., Jr., Jr. <laughs> he's just little. <laughs> it's okay. He's a big dude now. He's got a CISSP, right? Uh, and I have a whole bunch of other crazy certs because I went on that like rampage of I didn't go to college so I'm going to get a whole bunch of certs so that somebody could move me from you know 30 grand to 34 grand a year because I was still a worthless security guy who didn't know shit. Um, it doesn't it totally doesn't matter like my experience doesn't matter if if I say something that you can take and inspire or piss off somebody else with I probably did my job. Uh, if I don't, you know, you're boring and you don't listen because I don't want to take the blame. So it totally doesn't matter. And if you don't like it, you control me. That's completely fine. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, a lot of people aren't, and I just think it's funny. So this talk is not about hacking at all. So Please don't expect me to talk about hacking because I'm not going to and then you'll be really disappointed and if you want to hear a hacker talk, just get the F out. It's not going to bother me if you just leave. Exactly. So I'm not going to talk about O'Day, I'm not going to talk about war dialing, I'm not going to talk about how cool web apps are and how you can own everybody through a web app. I'm not going to talk about mobile phones in case that's the hip cool thing that you want to learn about. Um, I'm just not planning on doing it. So uh, the reason I give talks like this is because I, I want people to think, not to act. Right? Like, we act way too much. And we're full of crap most of the time because we're acting instead of thinking about what we're doing. So the reason I try and give some of these talks is hopefully to be funny and have drinks for free somewhere but also to get people to just think about the roles that we're really in. Cool? All right. So we're all on the same page. We'll kind of figure out you know, where this all began. So it, it began because th the only reason I decided to give this talk is because this, this dude in Sweden decided to send me an email one day, right? And so he sends me this email and He's like, hey, you wrote this blog post that I thought was really neat, and I want you to turn it into a talk. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll turn it into a talk. That'll be great. Um, so I got on a plane, and I was like, okay, I'll talk about how we just continue to get owned by everything. And we just get owned all the time. And we get really owned. Like, for real owned. Like, we get owned <laughs> so badly that we just can't even face it, right? It's just, we're just getting owned everywhere. And everybody's talking about how we get owned. <laughs> right? And it's just, it's, it's like just too much to handle. It's like way too much for us to handle, right? Because all we have are stats about how people get owned all the time. And then we use that to sell whatever our cool hipster shit is or whatever our plan is. And if anybody has ever listened to any of my podcasts or talks or anything, I, I always talk about this book, Rework, and one of my favorite quotes is that planning is guessing because that's what planning is. It's a guess. That's it. You can't logic me out of anything other than a plan is a guess. And whether you have like an educated guess, which is the like nerd term for my guess is better than your guess, <laughs> it's a guess. So what I want to talk about is not guessing about stuff. I want to talk about getting into fights. Okay? And, and I'm not talking about, you know, silly fights that have no answers. Okay? Because the patch for getting into a fight is getting into a fight. 
That's the only way you know how to get into a fight is by being in one. Until you get into a fight, you have no idea what you're going to do in a fight. You can guess. You can be like, I'll do the ninja jujitsu kiai, sweep the leg, and I'll win. But you won't because the dude's going to punch you in the face and you're going to go to sleep. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. Or the girl, like, like the little 100-pound chick is like, wham, and you're like, as you're going down, you're like, sucks for my reputation. You know? <laughs> I should have planned better. <laughs> right? But, but, but fights really have these awesome elements of surprise sometimes. If, you, if you're not planning on, like, going to get jumped at the flagpole at 5 o'clock or planning on fighting someone at a specific place in a specific time, or stepping into the ring because you're getting paid to fight them and they're a fighter too. The one cool thing that happens between all fights is that usually the people win because they have this like sneak attack. <laughs> right? They have this sneaky little move that owns you before you're ready to start fighting and your whole plan goes out the window. And, and again, one of my Favorite quotes ever from Mike Tyson is that everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Because that's a fact. You can plan all day and then wham! You're like, what the hell? You're like trying to find your IR document. You're like, do punch me in the face. Where I, I call my mom. And then bam! It's like, dude, hold, hold on. It's planning. I passed this shit on compliance. I'm good. I just need to figure out where I go next. Okay. So we, we identify that like, through this idea of fighting that we really, really suck at InfoSec because like, something's gone wrong. We, we planned to get into a fight, but it, like, don't get into fights. So it, it kind of got me thinking about like, the history of fighting and the history of really, really big superpowers fighting. Because that's kind of what we are now. We all think that we're big shit on the internet. Right? Everybody's huge on the internet. I mean, I'm big in Japan just because I'm over five feet tall. But, <laughs> you know, it's, it's different, right? You know, on the internet, it's different. You have to pretend like you're big. My giant three-person partnership company that I, I help run. Look at how awesome I am, marketing slicks and stuff. Right? Everybody has to be big because otherwise you don't get the money at the end of the day. And just as Bruce was talking about, business is all about making money. That's what we're here to do. So I was looking at war in general and I, I kind of, you know, I was ignoring the historians of war and just wanted to talk about the fights that happened and the fights that really, really made a difference in history. So. The bourbon's good here. People know this fight, right? The Persians were the Scythians. The Persians were dominating and destroying the world. They were the single most vicious army of their time, right? Well before anyone else stepped on the scenes in the, you know, 3000 BC plus. These people dominated the planet. You couldn't fight them if you tried. They would run over your country no matter how much money or how much technology or anything that you had. And the Persians got to a point that was so bad that these little nomadic tribes were kicking their ass so horribly that they decided to stop going to areas of the country because at the time, the Persian army leaders said, I will be surprised if anyone leaves with a head when he would send 10,000 people into an area that had 40 men. Think about that. You gotta be wicked afraid of somebody if you're sending 10,000 people and you're like, dudes aren't gonna live, so just send them somewhere else where they can actually fight. Important for us to think about. Right? These guys, the Romans, the Romans did awesome, right? Seeing how we all speak Latin? <laughs> they were killing it. 
literally. They dominated Europe, all of it. Started to move over to the other side. We're like, yeah, that's cool. We'll fight China. We don't care. <laughs> U.S. can't do that. We get owned by China. But the Romans were kicking their butt. Now, the Britons, they decided, hey, we're going to hang out in the trees. And when these dudes come, we're going to throw a bunch of knives at them and garbage and just launch shit at them until they start bleeding and dying, and we're going to run away. <laughs> it's like sequel injection. <laughs> right? And, and it, didn't, it didn't kill the Romans. It didn't stop them like the Scythians stopped the Persians. But what it did is allow them to be so weak and so scared that the Goths ended up beating their ass. Okay, so again, this type of hit and run sneak attack stuff worked. And it worked so well that people who well outmatched them in skill and prowess and planning and guessing and money and technology and everything else that all of us have in our enterprise get owned, right? More of them. Mongolians, I just think it's funny because when you look at it, it looks like it kind of says tug nuts. Um, so does anyone have an idea about the, the myth of how the Mongolians got completely conquered after they were getting, the, the Tagets were, were starting to destroy little pieces of their infantry? Because they were tactically defeating pieces of their infantry and not allowing their communication structure to happen through multiple different armies and regiments that they had. And because they destroyed some of that communication, they were able to wall people off and start injecting communication into those areas so that they could push people into valleys and take 20 or 30 people and kill a few hundreds every day. But you know how Genghis Khan died or the myth or the, the what people subscribe to that have historical evidence was? It's, it's screwed up, right? It's, it's wicked APT. It's like the APT. Okay, anybody heard the term vagina dentia? So they booby trapped an entire town of their women internally. And when Genghis Khan, who was known for coming in and sexually pillaging the town, came in, he got trapped. <laughs> and died from it. That's how you want to go down in the history book, right? <laughs> Look at all this money and power and everything that I have. Boop. <laughs> all gone. Again, just think about some of these things in the context of your company, right? You know who that is? <laughs> right? Dracula versus your Ottoman. Again. 25 years, the Ottoman Empire tried to conquer this little Albanian state, little tiny Albanian state. And for 25 years, one of the largest powers in the world was successfully defended off by Vlad. Because he got buck wild and attacked people whenever he wanted. There was no rules. There was no, oh, we're going to meet at the playground. He would go kill a bunch of people and do really nasty stuff to them to scare them and bounce and go back home. Sounds familiar. We have Sweden, right? No one knows about Sweden ever fighting. But Sweden was doing really well in the 1600s, right? And the Dutch snapping just completely annihilated like four of their armies in two weeks. How? Oh, well, they would wait till these people were sleeping or at dinner or and leave with their family. And they would just go kill their whole family. <laughs> and then people were like, uh, yeah, I don't want to be part of the army anymore because if that happens, your whole family gets killed, not you. So they'd just slaughter a whole bunch of people's families in front of them and be like, you can go live and go back and fight us. It's cool. We'll see you Wednesday. 
You have this little guy. He did well. It's such a great picture for such a crazy son of a bitch. Right? Midget, megalomaniac, psychopath who led France to their one and only war victory ever. <laughs> right? So, so here we have Napoleon crushing and destroying and making his own era. Yet, a group of Spaniards coined a really cool term called guerrillistas. Now, the guerrillistas were guerrilla warfare. It meant small wars. You weren't there to fight a massive war. You weren't there to win a 25-year campaign to conquer an entire country. You were there to kill that person that day. And that's your only objective. There was no plan. There was no anything else. It was, if I can kill them today, tomorrow's another day, and we'll figure out how to do it then. You guys getting how this applies to us? It's really interesting that we continue over and over again to bitch about getting owned when we've been getting owned this way for 6,000 years. And then even better, right? My, my favorite part of after coining this term and us crying and complaining about it, and no one's learned about this, you know, tricky warfare styles, right? People are just like, whatever, dude, march in a block, send a group of people into town, take over. Then we have this great little colony. And everything's going well, and people are wearing funny hats and doing stupid stuff and drinking tea. And you know, there's some people from there here, so they know what they lost. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and, and there's this giant mass, right? And the giant mass has an opposing force. It has this force that has this entropy to it. It has this piece of will that's not only connected to morality, but it's connected to faith. It's connected to protection. It's connected to religion. It's connected to them as people, right? That's, that's, that's what they're opposing. This, this unified conglomerate is opposing individuality. Um, so you look at them, and, and you're looking at them, and you're like, okay, how does the man walks in blocks, has drums? Like, how stupid is that? We're going to go fight a war. Do, 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 Like, I wonder if they're coming. You know, like, you think they're here? No, it's, they're probably just having a parade. Like, they're not going to come fight us. So you look at those and you take analysis of, of what the man is doing to you and how it's oppressing your beliefs and your roles, and you start to find flaws. And you find flaws that are really stupid. Like, you guys are all together in this one, like, little square. And if I put something into that square and kill a bunch of people... Like a whole bunch of blood pours out. Um, so you start looking for those flaws. And the flaws are really, really, really easy to find. Yes, that's Google hacking for SQL injection. And then you know exactly how to own them. Because you're doing it the easy way. You're tactically and operationally attacking them, not guessing about how you should get into a war with them. You're going one at a time, taking any shot that you can, and as soon as the shot opens up, everyone's ready to shoot. Right? It's pretty easy to take a shot if everyone's ready. So, take a shot, and then you hide. Right? And you start taking shots and hiding, and you're hiding so well that even in plain sight, directly in front of them, because of their perception, they can't see you. It has nothing to do with you not being there. This is one of my favorite photographers ever. Uh, anyone seen any of these? Yeah, it's just sick. Um, 
And I had to put another one in there because it's just so awesome. You know, if you know how to hide in front of someone, there's no better hiding place. So, what do you do? You hide, and then you go attack. And you attack enough, you win. Because you break the will of your opponent. Because they just don't know how to fight your way. They're really set in this opinion of fighting. Right? They're really set in the idea that, you know, my firewall is going to block you. Like, that's what they invested money into. That's what they invested capital into. That's what they invested their heart and their time. And, and their preaching around the organization is into their way of fighting, not fighting in general. So, structure still exists in that type of opportunistic fighting. You just have to kind of find it, right? So there's wings of how guerrillas fight. There's wings of how all people who opportunistically attack fight. So you have to look for those. There's military concepts. There's political concepts. You know, you can go through history and pretty much find all of these things. But, but at the end of the day, there really is only one patch for it, is just going through it. Now, I don't know if that means getting a pen test or if that means talking shit to Anonymous and getting owned. I don't know. That's up to you. You get in the kind of fight that you want to start. I mean, I'd get my ass handed to me by them. I know that. I probably have. But it's getting into the fight that helps, right? You know, we've gotten into fights before. <laughs> right? It worked out really well for us. Because we fought one way, which was this kind of silly conventional warfare, and they used the landscape that they knew to their advantage. Now, it, it blows my mind when I start looking at some of this stuff and I think, man, how well do we know our own IT landscape? Because I know when I'm doing pen tests, it takes me a long time to understand all the crap that people have, right? But if we were aware of our own landscape and kind of knew how to fight on our own turf, who cares if they know what we have? We know it infinitely better. No matter how many maps I can make or how many times I can say they have this box or that box or this flaw or that flaw or whatever else, if we know how to fight on home turf, we have an infinite advantage regardless of our flaws because we use our flaws to our advantage, right? I'm not providing you any type of solution. Please don't ask. I'm not going to. I just want you to think that you're not using your home field advantage right now. So how does it apply to us? Right? That's us for the most part. That's most of our companies because we've invested in this attack and defense strategy built around stuff like encryption. And anybody who remembers that t-shirt, I still have one. We invested in DLP and, and intrusion detection and data leakage and antivirus. And, and we invested in these huge platforms of strong authentication that does all this really crazy awesome integrated shit and integrity monitoring and file distribution and log management and firewalls. And, and that's, that's like... That's our corporation. Everybody get together in a square and arm your firewall and stupid crappy vendor shit and put it on the outside and just walk down the wall and be like, you can't attack me, I have all this crap. You know, and then they just like blow the road up and you're like, shh. <laughs> Who has a blow the road up appliance? And then you like look around and somebody's like, well, I mean, you know, my gas tank is kind of a blow the road up appliance. Um, it's in dev, the new version, which will actually <laughs> defend against the blow the road up thing. But right now, um, we're working on, uh, if you'll sign an NDA, <laughs> I'll bring you into a meeting that I'm gonna totally make up. Because if you have enough money, I'll build this crap with this company in China that I know. I mean. Excuse me. So I'll, 
we're on the way to building it, and it's it's called the APT Defender 3000 Elite Gold Pro. <laughs> and it's a next generation deep level packet inspection appliance that defends and detects any type of attack that can occur ever. <laughs> it's a little pricey, <laughs> but it does work. And you're like, well, I mean, I should at least go to the timeshare meeting to figure out if I get a free pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so you go, and you end up spending all this money, and then you're like, shit, I just added another wall to my castle and they have jets. Because <laughs> you get owned right after you install the mystery APT 3000 Gold Elite Pro. Um, so, you know, what happens when it rains? Well, you know, I kind of have a story about what happens when it rains, right? So, I was, and I'm married, right? So that's why I can be so much of an asshole. Um, and she loves me and she's the best person ever, so she lets me. But, so I'm like in my house, right? I, anybody, people own houses, right? And it sucks. <laughs> All of us know that owning a house sucks. Right? That's a common denominator. So I'm getting freaking screamed at because I'm on the road like talking at conferences and doing all this stupid shit. And, and I'm getting screamed at because the roof is leaking. Right? Do I look handy? <laughs> <laughs> Not handy at all, right? But I have Google and I have a lot of passion. So I'm like, I got it. It's cool. I got it. I'm coming home and I'm fixing the roof. So I like throw down. I learn everything about composite tile roofs and all this other crazy stuff. Everything's awesome. And I'm like, Psh, I'm pulling stuff off. And like, I'm in the zone, right? Like, I'm in Tim the Toolman Taylor. Like, I'm just hooking it up, right? And I get this thing like ultra throw down watertight. Like, I'm up there with the hose just laughing at it. I'm like, yeah, you can't do shit. You know, I'm just talking shit to my roof and I'm drinking. Um, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm, and I'm up there just hammering away at this thing, right? And, and so I leave and I go to this conference. So was, that was actually with Chris at. Um, and I get this really, really sad phone call. It wasn't the like, I'm mad at you sad. It was the like, stuff screwed up in the house sad which if they're not mad at me, that meant it was her fault. <laughs> and I was just trying to figure out how. So first I get the blame of like, there's water all over your office. And I'm like, there's water all over my office. Well, that's where the like leak in the roof was. And I'm like, God. so I'm, you know, immediately take it on myself. I'm like, God, God. like I suck. Like, I am not equipped to fix these things. I should have outsourced it. <laughs> I should have, right? Like, and I just should have outsourced it because I'm an idiot and I just got all pride and crazy. I was like, yeah, I got this stuff, right? Well, I get home to start my forensics on why I screwed up. <laughs> and there is no water at all underneath the place that I've hatched. There's none. And I don't get it. And so now I'm pissed because I'm not smart enough to figure out how the hell the water got all over my office. So, like, I do every bit of deductive reasoning you could possibly ever do, including, like, factoring in dragons and goblins and, like, other weird shit and people rolling the dice and, like, screwing me over and voodoo and everything, right? And, and I come up with, like, there's no possible way water could be here. It must be leaking from, like, under and coming up. And I, like, tear up my ceiling downstairs. Like, I jacked my house up. Right? And I do this while Jess is gone. And she comes home, and she's like, what did you do? <laughs> like, you made all these crazy rash decisions and just, like, tore the house apart. And I'm like, I'm trying to find the damn leak. She was like, it was really, really hot on Wednesday, and I left the window open, and it started raining, <laughs> and I went camping, and I didn't come home till Sunday, 
and I'm, my bad. <laughs> and, and as stupid as that is, like how many times do we do that as companies? We make these like crazy decisions and like rash movements and make these like wild psycho changes in our environment when it's something dumb like, oh yeah, just turn that port off. You know, they're like, no, we're going to re-architect the entire code to use a secure format that triple encrypts it. And then I'm going to have an iron key that I stuff into a laptop that individually authenticates each session. So I pull it out, put it back in. And no one's going to break that shit ever. You know, and then somebody punches you in the face and takes your iron key. <laughs> shit! You know, God! I was almost winning. Right? So that's what ended up happening. Right? I got screwed because of my own intelligence or lack thereof, or ambition even. Right? I was so ambitious to fix this stuff and had so much pride in my environment that like I was fixing it. And what happened? Goddamn user got me. <laughs> I'm like, shit. I was mad. But you can't hate the user. Like, I should have had an automatic rain sensing closing window. And, like, it's me being a douchebag for not having that at the end of the day. <laughs> I could have fixed it. But then I would have just been guessing that she was going to leave the window open in the rain. And that's crazy. <laughs> right? How much would it cost for me to guess all this other crazy stuff that she could have done or that I could have done or that the dogs could have done, right? Like, anybody have dogs, like, chew up furniture, like, chew through walls? Like, they do crazy stuff that you can't even imagine. They're like, this is a load-bearing beam, and the dog chewed through it, and, like, your house is going to fall over. And you just look at it, and you're like, oh, if PETA wasn't around, I would punch you. <laughs> now you just give them a little quick one, but still. <laughs> you can't do that to your wife anymore. Um, <laughs> anyway, so like, what do we do about this kind of stupid problem that we live in, right? So first, we stop doing all the crazy shit that we're doing right now because everything that you're doing, like literally everything that you're doing puts you on a track to getting owned and going out of business. Like if you're following conventional standards and guidelines, you are setting yourself up to be the people that are more advanced than you because the people that are more advanced than you are getting their ass handed to them by the people who are taking opportunistic attacks. Everyone like, agree with that, that the people that are getting owned are bigger than you are, or there are you, which makes it even more true. Um, so first is like stop and realize that we're doing things screwed up and need to completely change how we do stuff. It's not just a little tweak. It's a complete stop, destroy, delete all those projects and start over. Yeah, I know. They're like, that's not realistic. Yeah, it is. <laughs> stop. You know what else happens when you stop? All that money stops. Then you can apply it to something. OK. So two, we have to accept that there's no such thing as setting something up and never managing it or touching it again. If you have one of those things in your environment, just go back to the office, rip it out, throw it out the window, and it's cheaper than maintaining it and getting owned by it. Because you will force yourself into a pattern that allows you to ignore whatever flaw that that thing is supposed to be protecting you against. Ergo, you will never look at that flaw again. Because XYZ, you know, Ninja Master Pro has got that handled. And Ninja Master Pro Elite 2 has the other side of it handled that's the new shit. Right? As we were talking about before, there aren't magic bullets. There's nothing that's going to solve everything. So if you're on a path to go down this, this security rabbit hole that is supposed to solve like a whole bunch of security threats, look at it. Realize that a salesperson screwed you over give like two grand to an attorney and punch them in the face. <laughs> it, it's way better than therapy. You punch a sales dude in the face, it feels awesome. 
unless they're big, and then you punch them in the face and run like everybody else did, and you eventually will get them. <laughs> All right. My basic rule of security, the, the most basic rule of security that there is, complexity reduces security. The more shit that you have, the more shit that can get owned. Period. So let me take a really tough example for you. Antivirus. Does or does not with antivirus, right? That's it. Blocks it or it doesn't. Now, antivirus, if we look at it from an attack surface perspective, right? We have a port that does web. We have a port that does LDAP. We have a port that does you know, sharing and NFS, a couple other ports. So let's say we have six ports open on a box and we install antivirus. How many ports do we have open on a box after that? M more than six, right? Every single time, more than six. Now, did antivirus decrease or increase our attack surface? Right. You installed something that gave you a new way to get owned. <laughs> kind of counterintuitive. Now, I'm not saying don't have antivirus, right? Because that's crazy. Or, or is it? So if you could teach all of your users really, really, really awesome, safe browsing and computer usage habits, you think you'd need it? Maybe. Because someone's always going to be like, I want to see the kitty. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. It closed. Because they really do. They have to see the kitty. It's, it's, like a, it's like a need that they have in their body that's well outside of their consciousness. Right? So maybe that's why we have it. And we weigh the risk versus reward, and we go, OK. 60% of our users are going to want to see the kitty, so at least put AV on the machine, and then we just accept that our, our attack surface is increasing, not decreasing, but we're putting in some mitigating controls for stupidity or over-clickiness or just, you know, my favorite DEF CON quote is because people like to click shit. Okay, so we do that. We understand what our environment is and how we increase or decrease our attack surface. Every single thing that you do increases or decreases your attack surface. Pick one, there is no stay the same, ever. Any change increases or decreases, period. No gray area. Then, once, you, once you're able to do that and accept it, this is like a 12-step program because I drank a lot and I may as well go through it in security. I'll resolve something in life. Um, so then you have to figure out what are you actually protecting? Like, what are you protecting? You think if the company that takes credit cards loses all their credit cards, they're going to go out of business? Can anyone name one that lost all their credit cards and went out of business? Oh, Bank of America went out of business? Where? Yeah, they didn't. They're doing awesome. Matter of fact, they're charging you for using fucking cards now. That's awesome. They're like, hey, we get hacked, so now we're going to charge you for using your check card. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, that's cool. Putting a little kitty aside so they can get owned again. Fine. But, but since no one's telling me about, you know, all of those times that people got all of their credit cards exfilled and used and and all the credit cards leaked out, and then the company went out of business, I call bullshit on it because it's never happened. Yeah? So there's nothing to be afraid about with that. Now, what if that same company, let's say they sell some type of widget, and the hack goes in, and it destroys their manufacturing line that makes the widget, does that put them out of business? If they can't produce a product anymore? Yeah, of course it does. But if they can't take the credit card, they're like, well, if you want it bad enough, just call me and I'll process it some other way or just like write your card number down and charge it later when the phone system's up. Right? It doesn't put them out of business. So 
we have to figure out what actually matters to the business opposed to what is urgent and unimportant and screws with our time management and gets in our face and just kind of push that away. Does that make sense? I mean, well, it doesn't make sense because it's counterintuitive to what all of us are taught. But it's just protecting the stuff that's important. You know, like when you get into a fight and you don't know how to fight, you like curl up and protect, you know, your fun parts because like that's the part you want to save. You just know that, right? You're not just like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I just don't want my back to get hurt, you know? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so how do you do it? You figure out what's important. So the product line in your business, the brand in your business, sadly or not, your employees really are important as much as your executive management team are like, whatever, we can fire them and outsource them to China. I mean. If the call center in China gets firebombed by somebody who's angry, then you're screwed as well. So you gotta protect them in some way. And really, you gotta protect the bottom line because, as Bruce said, it's all about the money. And if you don't protect the bottom line, you're not protecting a damn thing. So, how do you do it? You shut up, because your opinion totally doesn't matter. Unless you're the people who own and started the business, you're, literally your opinion doesn't matter at all. And because you try and make your opinion matter, you actually steer the business in the wrong way to protect things that you think are important instead of the business thinks are important. You start to think like them through questions and answers and going drinking with them or getting blackmail and having them tell you. And then you gotta do work, right? You gotta focus on all of these things in the business, right? You have to really look up to them and understand, like, how does this stuff happen? You know, and if, if you have a bump that it's not a tumor, it's just a bump, right? So look through. What are your products? I mean, if you're a service company, you still have a product. The product is your service. So what does your company do? How does it do it? And how do those strategies increase what you do, increase protection on what you do. I know all this sounds like mumbo jumbo, but like if you really think about your company, I have a feeling that all of these things that you're protecting and all these really awesome technologies and stuff, you're gonna have a really hard time tying that back to how does my widget get made better? You're gonna be like tie it back to, well, remember when Antisec owned so-and-so, which is back to the castle, you're gonna get destroyed, right? Identify where the money comes from. Seems pretty logical. If the money comes from one place and goes to this place, I need to protect that place, this place, and the transfer of the money. Yeah? Cool. Really easy to find. You have to think like a hacker. So if you're looking at the environment and you're saying, well, I think you could break into this stuff, see where you can go with that. Develop your access and say, look, I can now get back into these important bits. Here's what we have to do to move away from it. Tell people about competitors. Competitors suck. They take money out of your pockets. That's what their job is, is to be better at what you do than you do. So you profile your competitors, you figure out exactly what stuff that they would want, and that goes back into the bucket of hardcore stuff that we have to protect no matter what. I mean, this stuff is really easy. It's not, but it really is. I mean, you could take the like CISSP approach and just screw yourself because you're going to protect everything and then you're going to have the whole castle thing and then somebody's going to come in and laugh at you and like kick the door down and kill all your people. Um, but, but it's all about that kind of tried and true classification, right? It's all about taking the standards of whatever you make them, whether it's CIA or something else, and I know, oh God, CISSP, but really, really is these things map to the business you can map them to how critical things are. So anyone ever have this conversation and you're looking through these things and you're trying to rank how critical patient data and trying to map how credit cards and marketing information and straight up cash, how those things are important to your business and what comes first. There's no way to say everything comes first, so you have to be able to show me a program that says this comes first and this is why. Can, you, can any of you do that in your business right now? Tell me what you're going to protect first and why? One person? 
that's two. And, and it's probably one and a half because you guys are both lying in different ways. <laughs> but like, that's crazy. We're at a security conference and we can't do it. Like imagine the other people who just have no clue. So go through, have the conversations with them. Let them decide. It's totally above our pay grade to decide this stuff, right? If the business decides and they say, yes, this is the most important thing, patient data, then you go, cool. The most important thing, which is patient data, will get protected with every single possible technique I can do. It's gonna cost X dollars. And they go, well, all right, actually, so some of these things have some different meanings and, and maybe we'll change this to be high and this one's now gonna come low and they start changing it. And you start getting scores out of it. And you say, okay, cool, fine, you can change it as much as you want, it's yours. I'm just the person who's defending the castle. I don't give a shit what's in the castle. I just, I'm just, my job is to defend the castle. So tell me where to defend first and I only have a limited budget so I'm gonna go after those little pieces and then expand out as I can. Well they go, okay, protect five. Awesome, no problem, it's X number of dollars. They're like, well, all right, I can't just let credit cards get out. We have PCI and all this other stuff. So protect five and four. And you're like, okay, no problem. And they're like, but, but I don't understand why cash is so low. I mean, if people steal our cash, they're stealing our money. So we have to protect that. So protect everything. Sure. So to protect a five, it costs $56,000. Because there's only a little piece. To protect a five and four, it costs $300,000. To protect five through one, it costs $765 million. Because I'm gonna protect them all just like I protect five. And they look at those numbers and they go, uh, no, just protect five. <laughs> and you say, okay. And then when you ask for a budget to start working down to four, they already know why you're working down to four and magically, it just kind of like falls from the sky and it finds you. Because they're sick of being up all night long going, did I really just tell Chris that he shouldn't protect credit cards? <laughs> we don't have the money to do both, but he said don't protect credit cards because this, and I told him that this is more important. Shit. <laughs> and they stay up all night. It's awesome. They come back into the office, they're like, what if you protected 4.5? And you're like, 4.5 doesn't exist on our chart. <laughs> and they're like, what about 4.3? And I'm like, hold on. Boop. And I hit them with the number. And they're like, Ugh, too much. I'm like, you can't negotiate it. <laughs> like, that's just the number. That's just what it's going to take. Like, if you want to take it and get all these controls and go, like, budget people out and try and get them for cheaper, go for it. Cool. I get all the stuff that I want for a cheaper price and it's not my money so I don't care. <laughs> Go get it. And then they realize that they can't get it even though they're the big giant awesome company that they think that they are. And they're like, oh man. So then they go and they lobby and they're like, I'm sick of being up all night. I wanna be able to tell my guys to like protect credit cards but I actually walled myself into this stupid corner where I said only protect the patient information and they're like, we'll just protect the cards. And they're like, yeah, but we can't because we had all these conversations and like it really is more important that since we're a hospital that we don't just like kill people over the network because that would suck and then people won't come to the hospital anymore. But if we lose their credit cards, we're just gonna like have a little thing in the news and it's gonna actually be publicity for us, which will be cool because then people will know that we're in their neighborhood and they're gonna come down and they're not gonna give a shit because they don't have any money anyway. So we may as well just, just and they just look at them and they're like, all right, just, just, just take care of both of those and we'll, we'll figure out how to do it, right? Um, I know all this whole talk was way too boring, but I just wanted to go over some general ideas because I think too many times we worry about the fix and not about the pattern of thought. So I, I, I really, really, really want you guys to think instead of acting. Because to me, it'll make it 
easier for us to act in the moment. And obviously, if we act in the moment and we act effectively in those moments, it's going to be a hell of a lot better than the poor guesses we've been making that has gotten us owned from here on back. That's, that, I don't know, that's, I don't have any more slides. What do you, what do you think? Am I just too far? Yeah. I don't even think there's, I don't know. It's awesome, I did it like Bruce. I'm like, you can have questions. Mm -hmm. I don't know, do you have any questions or like thoughts on it or places that are just totally unrealistic or what? I don't know, I mean, I don't, I'm not sitting there. I'm, I'm drunk listening to myself talk. I'm like 60 hours of no sleep. What do you think? No comment? You guys suck. <laughs> like, I'm fine to say that to a bunch of people. I'll get jumped. Like, no, but, I mean, logical stuff, yeah? Cool, that's all I want.